Hello, everyone. Welcome to this year's Virtual Outreach Engineers Week and Girl Day 101. Um, my name is Thea Saar. I'm the Director of Communications and Programs for Discover E. And we are a coalition of organizations dedicated to reaching students and parents through our network of volunteers and educators showcasing how the engineering design process is a transformative experience and um, really engages students and engineers. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, if you're not familiar with Discovery, here's a few things that we do. Uh, chats with change makers, Engineers Week, of course, introduce a girl to Engineering Day, um, our Persist series, World Engineering Day, we have activities and we added a new library of at-home engineering this year and copyright free photos. And we're gonna get into a lot of all of this stuff. So um, all of these resources are free and available to you, our uh, network of volunteers and educators. So uh, Engineers Week, uh, we are really thinking a lot about Engineers Week this year. It's February 21st to the 27th, so it's coming right up. Um, and it's all about imagining tomorrow. And so how do we imagine tomorrow in this new COVID world with uh, virtual outreach? And we scoured the world to look for great examples for all of you of folks who are doing um, virtual outreach. So right now I'm gonna welcome um, my two uh, panelists uh, this afternoon. First is Katie Cox. Uh, Katie is the membership director for the Professional Engineers of North Carolina. She specializes in event planning, organizational leadership, sales and marketing. And prior to joining the Professional Engineers of North Carolina, uh, she worked for several other not-for-profit organizations, including the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And she earned a degree in journalism and mass communications from the University of South Carolina and a master's in health education at Promotion from Virginia Tech. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you. And our other panelist this morning is Zanab Ebis. She is the founder and CEO of SciTech to You. She received her bachelor's from Knoxville College and her master's from the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. Her work at Procter & Gamble, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, BioVerus, Panoa, Pano, I think I spelled that, said that wrong, PanBio, and more recently Fortis College, gives her diverse knowledge across multiple STEM disciplines. Uh, she was an active member of Women in uh, Bio Youth Committee for three years. And when she's not homeschooling her six children, she's a busy soccer mom working on how she can make her community at large um, uh, by organizing and collaborating to provide meals and hygiene packets to the needy. Uh, she is dedicated to help making her community and country a better and peaceful place to live. Welcome. Thank you. You. Thank you. All right. So when you all registered um, for today's session, uh, we asked you a couple of questions. Uh, a, because we're nosy, and B, we really wanted to figure out how we could um, organize this session so it was meaningful for you. So the first question we asked was, how are your plans coming along? And a small percent of you are all set, yay. Um, a larger, larger number, uh, COVID has definitely ham hampered your efforts. Um, and you're all looking for some ideas and the vast majority haven't started yet. And no worries uh, on that if you haven't started yet. Uh, we're here to give you um, some good ideas today. And uh, Engineers Week is really an opportunity for all of us to kind of sit back and say, hey, we want to want to engage students in, uh, in engineering. We want to celebrate engineers, but it's not something that has to happen uh, during that seven day period. It's really a state of mind and something that we hope you do all year long. Um, the other question we ask you is what do you hope to learn today? Um, the vast majority of you are curious about how others are doing outreach. So that is why we have the two uh, panelists we have today. Uh, very small number of you are looking for ready-made opportunities, but that's not going to thwart us. We are going to talk about that. And uh, you're all looking for resources you can use. So 
Um, uh, the other person uh, on this webinar is our colleague Ellen from Discover E, and she is going to be monitoring the um, the QA um, session uh, portion of. Uh, box, whatever you call that, the question box. And so just put it in your control panel and she will be monitoring those and we'll be checking in with her periodically. Um, we're not gonna save all the questions till the end will be, um, so if you have a question for our panelists or uh, something that you really wanna know, just type it in and uh, she'll either interject or um, uh, we will get to your questions throughout today's webinar. All right. So I'm gonna be quiet for a minute and I am going to ask um, uh, both of our panelists to just tell us a little bit about themselves and their outreach efforts pre-COVID. And then we'll talk a little bit about how that's changed and what they're doing now in COVID. So um, Katie, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, so I'm Katie Cox. I'm the membership director for PENC, uh, the Professional Engineers of North Carolina. We're a nonprofit association. Uh, we are a state society of NSP, which is the National Society of Professional Engineers. And part of our mission is to offer outreach. Um, so every year during E-Week, we try to organize some sort of outreach program. Um, in 2019, we did a screening of the film Dream Big. Uh, we offered one in Charlotte and one in Raleigh, and we invited our members to come and their families. And then we sponsored uh, some high school classes to come out and see that as well. Um, then in 2020, before COVID hit and shut everything down, <laughs> we were actually able to send some volunteers into schools. Um, so we paired schools with volunteers from our organization and our volunteers went into classrooms and actually um, demonstrated an, an engineering activity. Um, a lot of them got their activities from Discover E, um, which was a great resource for them. Um, and I think we had about 300 kids participate in that total. Um, so that was a, a great response for that outreach program. Awesome. Uh, uh, Zainab, can you tell us a little bit about your um, efforts, your education efforts, how you got involved, um, your, kind of your journey? <laughs> Yes, sure. Um, I started um, about uh, 10, almost 10 years ago, it'll be 10 years this April. But um, I started, the, the reason why I started SciTech 2 was basically, was because I used to teach at a for-profit college and I had one student in my class who wasn't, you know, very good student from all intents and purposes. He was tardy. He was absent a lot of times. And then one day I just spoke to him and told him, look, I see you, you could be a good student. I've seen some of your good work. So if you apply yourself, you can do good work. And so, you know, I, it was a lengthy conversation, a lot longer than what I've just stated, but he made a turnaround. He started going from, you know, E's and F's to A's and B's. I mean, he did really good work. About two weeks in, um, the president of, our school came in with two plain police officers, arrested him and took him away. So for me, that was really heartbreaking and really shocking to see someone with so much potential have his dreams shattered. So that was the impetus for starting SciTech to you. I thought the best way to start SciTech to you is to start when they're young, when the students are young, underrepresented kids, even though there are STEM programs around, a lot of students in the underrepresented communities don't have access to it, meaning they don't have the resources or the awareness of the programs existing. So I started SciTech to you to reach out to the um, underrepresented communities. And what I would do is I would go to local schools, talk to them, let the um, leaders in the schools know that we're around, I, I advertise in newsletters, I get students, I take 10 at a time because I wanna give them that undivided attention and we would have face-to-face -face and all of the programs are experiential. And because I have a broad background in you know, government, pharmaceutical, biotech and um, academia, I bring everything. So they learn lab notebook and once they step into my class, they're in a lab. All the requirements of working in the lab is applied when you come into my class, lab notebooking, taking the safety precautions that PPE, you know, 
everybody now know today know about PPE because of COVID, but my students knew about PPE, you know, on day one. Um, and a lot of what I do has been experiential for them. So a lot more hands-on because I feel like students learn more by doing and not just by listening and reading. So that's our pre-COVID um, story in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, we're right there with you. Everything, you know, that hands-on is so important. And I think that's what people have been really struggling with is how do we turn those experiential learning where you're face-to-face -face and you're giving the kids the stuff and they're doing it and, you know, there's lots of excitement. How, how does that translate? How, how has COVID changed your efforts to engage students in engineering and STEM? Um, We'll stick with the same order because I, I did that in the slides. <laughs> so, Katie, do you wanna do you wanna tell us uh, how that's uh, translated for you? Sure. So, um, we wanted to kind of keep our outreach going uh, with providing some sort of engineering activity for kids. Now, obviously, with virtual school and social distancing, we didn't want to send volunteers into schools. That's not really an option. Um, so, we are making. Uh, engineering activity kits um, and that we will send in the mail to middle school students. Uh, we chose an activity off of the Discover E website. It's Windy City Tower activity. And um, kids that sign up will get this activity packet in the mail. Um, it's, you know, simple materials. It's paper, a ruler, tape. Um, so easy for us to put together. They'll receive the packet in the mail with the instructions on how to complete the activity. They'll do it at home on their own time. And then during engineers week, they're gonna jump on a virtual call with one of our engineer volunteers, and they're gonna discuss um, the project. They'll talk about their design. They'll talk about the engineering um, elements of it. Um, and then they'll also have time to ask the engineer volunteer um, just what engineering is like, what, what it's like to work in engineering. Um, and just, you know, some general Q&A time with the engineer. So I noticed there's a little uh, video slide, uh, Katie, on a uh, picture on the slide. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm not going to yeah, so, without sharing that. <laughs> so um, I tell all of my volunteers, you've got to do the activity that you choose first before you, you know, do it with kids. Um, so this video I made where I was actually doing the, uh, the activity that we're mailing out, um, I wanted to provide a video resource for the kids so that they could watch uh, an example of how the activity is done and also see a familiar face so they know who they'll be meeting with. I'll be on all of our calls, our virtual calls. Um, so it puts a little personality with it. They can um, see who I am, see who PNC is, um, and then they also have a visual of what the activity could look like. Awesome. Um, so now tell us a little bit about your journey from in-person to virtual. And these are actually some pictures of her kids uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from her program. Yeah. So um, during, right before COVID, we had decided to start a, uh, to do a spring camp um, similar to what you see on the screen. And that was squash because everything just kind of closed down right around spring break for us in Maryland. And then summer program, that didn't pan out too because we were still kind of adjusting. So um, we typically don't do after school programs, but because of the pandemic and schools were closed, there was a great need for the services that we provide in terms of engaging students. Um, that first spring, a lot of parents, you know, were frustrated because the, you know, just adjusting the transition to in um, virtual learning the kids weren't really getting connecting with the students. And so after school program, we partnered with two other organizations that were local small nonprofit like ours. And we reached out um, and we were able to start an after school program. And this year we focused on our aeronautics. So it was virtual. We prepared kits very um, similar to what Katie's program had. We prepared kits and we'll have a pickup and drop off points, we'll prepare the kits each month and the students will, the parents will pick up the kits and then we will do virtual learning. I um, had K through 12, so on Mondays, um, we have the elementary school students, Wednesdays were the middle school students and um, Thursdays were the high school students and it went for an hour and a half every day of the week. And some of the things that our students did, they did um, projects from 
making parachutes, um, making airplane models, dissecting um, grasshoppers to look at the forces of flight. They experienced um, co-piloting. They actually flew a plane with a, a licensed pilot. They um, experienced um, skydiving as well. And they also had an opportunity to uh, listen to, I had a speaker series where we had different um, scientists, um, nuclear scientists came and spoke to them. Um, an engineer, two engineers came and spoke to the students and an energy person also came and spoke to the students in our speaker series. So they got, got a wealth of experience. Um, a lot of it, most of it was hands-on experience and the um, Younger students also have flight simulation. The elementary students have flight simulation as well. And this, um, this month they're actually learning circuitry where our elementary school students are making simple circuits where they turn on the light bulb. Um, the middle school students are do, doing snap circuits. And then the high school students are actually making, doing Arduino projects, learning about LED and making connections and coding. And we also had, we had a, a winter program where we had chemistry. They were look, looking at slime, making different solutions. And also um, the robotics where we were using the itty bitty buggy where they were using scratch to code um, a, a tiny robots and designing engineering different. They made sloth, ladybug, a monster and um, designed a buggy as well. So very comprehensive, very experiential, and they learn without even knowing. And they also keep a scientific notebook. They're learning the um, engineering design process as they go along. So we interject those information while they're doing without even them realizing that they're actually learning these things. Now, if like me, you're out there listening, you're thinking, wait a minute, she did all this in person. No, she didn't. The, the flight simulation and the, um, the, the, there was like two field trips that they did, in-person field trips, but everything else was virtual, wasn't it? Yes, everything else was virtual. Just the flight simulation and the co-piloting were in person. Of course, we took the um, safety measures required, face mask and, mask and distancing, but yeah, everything was virtual. And where, where were your students from? Uh, were they all from the Maryland area or where, where did you draw your students from? Yeah, they were from um, three, four, five different states. So we had um, students in Maryland, um, different counties in Maryland. We had students from um, DC, District of Columbia, Washington, DC. We had students from Virginia, students in Indiana and students in Michigan. So we had them from all over and we mail things out too. So the ones that are farther away, We'd mail our kits out to them. The one they were closer, sometimes if they weren't able to, you know, they didn't have access to a vehicle, I will drop off. And those who had access to a vehicle, we have a drop off spot somewhere in the middle where everybody can kind of meet and um, they'll pick up their kits and they'll go home for the month. And every month it was a new kit and it was nice for the kids to see, wow, what are we doing this month? So that was also nice. Ellen, are there any questions uh, that uh, for Katie or Zanab that we want to get to right now? Uh, sure. Actually, a lot of great questions are coming in. Um, first is, is one for Katie asking um, just about sending activities uh, for kids to do. Um, I've seen actually two, two parts to this question. The first is um, you know, about asking about funding for those materials and, and how you go about that. And the second is um, asking specifically, Katie, why send for the kids to do themselves as opposed to maybe having a breakout session where you're leading them through that activity? So sure. I'll let both of you respond to the funding part. Um, so we were lucky enough to receive a grant from Discover E um, to put this program together. So we're very grateful for that. Um, and that was able to fund our kits to be sent out. I will say we've already reached our max. We, we, our goal was 100 signups and we are there. We, we reached that yesterday. Um, and I have a waiting list going. So I'm gonna reach out to my PENC board and see if they'll fund the additional kits that we need. Um, in previous years, our outreach funds come from our, our board, um, our board budget. And then in terms of sending the kits individually, 
um, instead of having the kids do it on their own instead of as part of a breakout group. I think that, um, you know, anytime that the, you have a group of, we're gonna have 20 kids on the virtual call. Um, and once kids are, we want kids moving around, uh, building, exploring. And, and part of it is that, you know, they might design something and it won't work and they'll redesign. And I think all of that movement just gets a little hectic when you're in a virtual environment. Um, so we were kind of thinking that they would complete the activity on their own, come to the call and they'll have things to talk about then. They'll, they'll be able to talk about what worked, what didn't work um, and make the 45 minutes that they'll have with the engineer a little more focused um, rather than have it be um, experimental time. Thank you. Uh, Zainab, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, um, in terms of funding, the, this year we had uh, a COVID grant um, from the Department of House and Community Development. So that helped us out a lot. We also do um, crowdfunding to generate more funds to support our program. And we're constantly looking for grants and Discovery E has also, thank you very much, have. Um, given us a grant also to continue our work. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, individual donors um, help out um, government. We try to uh, reach out to different uh, grant opportunities um, to do our work. So that's, and then in terms of our work, we do the experiments with the students. Um, sometimes we do go out into breakout rooms when one or two individuals are having specific problems and. We don't want to talk over each other. I quickly set up breakout rooms with our volunteers and they'll go in or myself go in separately and kind of um, troubleshoot their issue. And then we reconvene together again and move forward. I think that the, the thing is, um, what's interesting is it can work either way, mm -hmm. right? There's no, there's really going to be no set um, formula of whether the kids do the activity offline or they do it with you when you have breakout rooms for help. Um, it's going to be between you and the educator you're working with or the, the group that you're working with to bring, the, to bring all the students together. Ellen, any other questions we want to address now? Uh, just one more right now. Um, in terms of um, contacts at, at, at schools or, or after school programs, you know, who's typically your first contact that you go to, um, you know, at a school to try to make, you know, to, to make an arrangement for a virtual event? Um, um, so yeah, how, how did you do that, Katie? Because you, 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 you have a good story there. Yeah, so we actually um, use word of mouth for our members to promote the activity. And then um, I also reached out to education foundations in our state. Um, and then they were able to distribute the information um, to lots of schools at a time. Um, so I would recommend checking in to see if there's any education foundations. Um, if I reach out to a school directly, I usually try to find an individual teacher uh, we have a lot of STEM schools with STEM classes and STEM teachers. And so that's usually my, my main point of contact to go to um, since they are working directly with the kids. Yeah, um, I would agree with her. I think everything she said is right on point. And the only other thing I would add is if you ha already have a relationship with a school, then you know the point of contact there will be a good place to start. And then from there, you can um, start communicating with STEM teachers and other areas. Sometimes even elementary school will have a relationship with a middle school and, and middle school will have a relationship with a high school. So you could kind of make those connections from grade level to grade level and they could give you the contact or give you a recommendation. Um, the other thing is I, I mentioned earlier, I partner up with other organizations. So other organizations um, that do similar um, projects or work, not necessarily like one of the organizations that I partner with does more social service for women and children. So that's another great place to look for um, reaching students, um, organizations that do work with other, maybe not necessarily in STEM, but in other areas that can uh, reach the students and families you're looking to reach. Nice. All right, we're going to hold um, questions uh, uh, for a little bit and just 
um, talk a minute. So you heard from Katie and Zanab what they're doing and you might be thinking, okay, there's a lot there. So how do I do this? What, what is virtual outreach for me? And I think the very first thing is to think about what do you want to share? Do you want to share career information for high school students? Do you want to be more of a project advisor or an activity leader? Um, are there resources you can provide? Um, what we've been hearing um, from educators throughout the pandemic is, um, you know, simple supplies they're desperate for, or even, um, you know, printing instructions on paper paper, because uh, these poor teachers are, if they're doing hybrid or if they're doing virtual, how are they sharing um, hands-on activities with students? Um, are you comfortable doing this alone or do you want to team up with somebody? Um, this is uh, probably a really good year to team up because you don't even have to be in the same place if you're going to do it virtually. Um, and then, you know, do you want to organize something yourself or do a ready-made opportunity? And um, you got great advice from Cadence and Up about where you can find teachers, where you can find uh, youth leaders. But you know, the other question to ask is, does your engineering um, organization, are they already planning something? Um, look at uh, parents in your neighborhood, relatives. Um, do you have existing relationship with teachers, which was what Katie talked about? Um, oh, look, and that's in there twice. Uh, does your company or association have relationships that you can uh, take advantage of? And I love uh, Zanab's, uh, you know, go outside the box. We don't just have to go to uh, teachers or after school programs, but are there um, organizations that are serving uh, the audience um, that you want to reach out to that might be looking for programming during Engineers Week? I think this is an opportunity for us to kind of broaden, um, broaden uh, who we traditionally work with. So um, structuring your visit. Um, uh, this is, you know, this, this is the, 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 the million dollar question, right? Um, when you're thinking about structuring your visit, if you're going to be working with a teacher or an after school provider, you know, really uh, having a conversation with them um, about what are the rules and best practices for volunteers. They may have a whole system in place for bringing uh, volunteers in, like uh, like like uh, uh, Side of You uh, has all kinds of. They're they're ready for volunteers. <laughs> um, and then asking, where are the students? Are they online? Are they in class? Is it a hybrid? Do you want to do one visit or multiple visits? Um, and uh, how can you support what's happening in the classroom or after school? So it's really having a whole series of, of, of questions that are important for you, but are really trying to get at what, the ed, what are the goals of the educator. And when you signed up, we promised you the Scrooby uh, uh, guide on how to set up a virtual visit. And it really goes more in depth on structuring your visit, not only from um, uh, these questions, but the various ideas of whether you do your activity, you, you hand, um, you, this is something you might want to talk to the educator. Does he or she want you to challenge the students to an activity and then have them do it offline and then come back and do a share out? Or do they want it more live and in person? And what kind of resources and materials are the students going to need and how can you provide? Um, we have another act, uh, webinar coming up on February 23rd, which is going to be about how we create inclusive STEM environments. And as I've been doing some pre-work with them, this last question is really becoming um, important. It's how do we connect with the kids virtually? How do we make them feel comfortable? How do we make them feel seen? And how do we kind of... Um, make sure that we're not just talking at the kids, that there's an opportunity for some back and forth. So, um, so we talked a lot uh, um, uh, about this and Katie and Ab and I, we had a fun conversation on Friday where we talked about different icebreakers. So here's our first icebreaker uh, and I'm gonna start a poll um, with all of you where I want you to tell me um, what kind of, uh, if you have pets, and uh, so do you have birds, dogs, cats, horses, uh, do you have llamas? And uh, 
a funny llama joke, uh, which makes a lot more sense if you know that I am from Boston. But do you know that there's three ways to spell the word llama? So that there's one L llama, which is the Dalai Lama, the two L llama, the animal, and the three L llama, which is a really big fire in Massachusetts. <laughs> so none of you have llamas. Um, some of you have horses, but uh, so um, I'm going to share the results of our poll. Uh, a, a wide variety of you don't have pets, a couple birds, lots of dogs, cats. Oh, well, the cats are in there twice. Um, horses. Um, so just kind of a fun little icebreaker poll with a really bad joke in there um, to kind of uh, let you share your personality a little bit. Um, some other kind of icebreaker games. Now, if you want to talk about the count to 100 with a twist game. Oh, yeah. So if you ask someone to count to 100 or a group of people to count to 100, they can probably do it. But the thing about it is it's just a team effort. And it also helps with communication where if you have maybe we're too large for 277 people right now. But if you have a room full of students, and you break them up into groups and then you ask them, and this is really good for virtual, right? You ask them to count to a hundred, but without any order. So, but the twist to that is you can't, two people can't say one or three at the same time. So everybody's kind of like looking at each other, like who's going to say it if they, if two people or more say it at the same time, you have to start back at one. So the first time I did this, I think we got to six. The second time we had to talk about it, come up with a strategy, and then we got to 13. And there's a time limit, so you have to be able to count to 101 minutes. So that's kind of like where that um, the twist, the other twist comes in. So when we finally got strategized and really did it well, we got to about 40 in one minute. So that's a good um, team building effort there. And it's a way to really break the ice and get people talking to one another very quickly. Yeah. Katie, will you tell what alphabet objects is, what that one was? Sure. So this is also best for a small group. Um, we'll probably do it with our 20 uh, virtual call, 20 kids. Uh, but you go through the al alphabet, A through Z, and you say the letter A. And anyone that has something in their space with the letter A shows it on camera. So A, I've got an acorn. All right, B, who's got something with a B? Someone might show a book. C, I've got a cell phone. And you go down the, the alphabet like that. And it's a good way to see um, a little bit of kids' personalities because you see what's in their space. And they sometimes come up with some pretty funny things. And, and I was having trouble when, when we were playing this game. I'm like, no, I don't have anything, but I have a goat. <laughs> and Katie's like, well, that'll be great for G. But you'll have to wait, Thea. <laughs> so we had a, a fun laugh about how you're going to have those kids who are going to jump ahead. And then you'll know a little bit more about the kids you're working with. Um, so there's all kinds of fun icebreakers, um, you know, asking kids their favorite breakfast cereal. Can they spell their name in alphabetical order? Um, so just, just opportunities and ways for them to get to know you a little bit. And, and if you have, you know, you want to show off your goofy side or get them kind of comfortable and that this is just going to be a fun, interactive, um, you know, even if the kids already know each other. They don't necessarily know you. They might not know if you're doing with a co-presenter. So this just gives you a chance to, to kind of um, get to know each other a little bit. Um, Ellen, any questions before we uh, dive into choosing activities? Uh, yes, we do have some more questions that have come in. Uh, one is asking, you know, for these virtual events, um, you know, how do you address uh, you know, the potential for burnout um, with kids, you know, being in more virtual um, type of screen environments now with, with school and maybe 100% of their time with school. Um, so, so what are some ways around that to help with that? Uh, will you, you've got the most experience there. Will you kind of talk to that a little bit? Um, uh, yes. So one of the things like for the spring, uh, winter break, I'm sorry, the winter break, I would um, give them we, it was from nine to two. So at 11 o'clock, I give them a 15 minute break, kind of let them do what they, they kind of get into the work and they get excited and then they go away and take a 15 minute break. And then at the top of the hour at 12 o'clock, they get a 45 minute break. 
So one way to kind of prevent that burnout is to give them strategically placed breaks in there where they can um, kind of go away and then come back. The other thing is it's not really virtual learning the way we do it because they're actually doing hands-on activities. So they're not staring at the screen. They're not constantly listening to the teacher um, speak. They're actually doing so. They don't, it doesn't have a virtual feel to it, even though they're kind of in the camera, they're more hands-on and their hands are looking down and looking at their activity. And the only time they look up is really to ask a question. But I think um, strategically placing breaks there and strategically giving them um, something else to do aside from staring at the screen would help. Um, something else that I think Katie implemented this is have them do it off camera and then meet, say for instance, meet in the morning to discuss the activity of the day, give, give, meet them off camera, have them do the activity and maybe meet two or three hours later to kind of check their progress and then maybe meet at the end of the day again to check their progress and kind of close it out and um, address any issues that may have come up while they were off camera. That's another way to kind of help with that burnout. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, that actually is a really nice segue into choosing activities. And um, we wrote an article, Discovery uh, published an article uh, over the summer about the engineering design process and how it is really well situated for this, um, for virtual learning. And, um, uh, and, and, and without any prompting, <laughs> you hit the nail on the head about just why it works so well. Um, because you're really, you're engaging the kids, they're having something to do with their hands, they're using their minds. You are there as a prompt, you're there as a guide, you are there as a facilitator, but they're actually doing the learning and they're not just having it kind of kind of come at them and you know, you're not just talking to them over the video, you're not just um, asking them uh, to do something, um, you know, to, 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 to parrot something back to them, you're mm -hmm. actually having them drive the learning. Um, and so when you think about your virtual or what you want to do virtually, we would really encourage you to think about doing a hands-on activity, um, especially one that follows the engineering design process of, you know, you know, identifying the problem and brainstorming and really that, that iterative design process where they're design, building, testing, that's where the magic happens. That's where kids get really excited. Um, and uh, the other piece to be thinking about and what, what we've done um, is really think about the materials that uh, you're, when you're choosing activities, are there low cost materials or ready materials that students, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic status might have in their household? Um, so one activity we have is um, Pen Factory and all the, all the kids need are a variety of pens that they're allowed to take apart um, and try to put back together. Or keep a cube, which, um, you know, if they have paper and a cereal box or a pizza box, um, can they, and some tin foil, can they design a device that can keep an ice cube from melting over 90 minutes? Um, so uh, really thinking about, are the materials accessible or are you able, um, like Katie and Zanab have been doing, to mail um, or deliver the uh, materials in advance. You still want those low cost materials because if you're making a hundred bath, you know, a hundred bags, um, you might not necessarily want to be stuffing it with everything, uh, everything that they're going to need. So um, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, what do you all look for, Katie and Zanab? What do you look for when you're uh, uh, looking at an activity and how do you structure it virtually? Like how, you, we've talked a little bit about this, but uh, can you go a little bit more in depth on what you do there? So we um, started looking for an activity. We knew we wanted to reach middle school students. So the first thing is make sh making sure it's age appropriate. Um, you know, the what we chose might be a little too difficult for elementary school students and high school students would probably be like, that's a waste of time. So make sure it's it's a good fit for the age group that you're reaching. Um, also, we did look for low cost, easy to mail 
um, material. So we can fit everything in an envelope that makes it a lot more affordable than having to fit something in a box and ship 100 boxes. Um, also, something with easy instructions um, for both the volunteer and the kids to follow. Um, and then usually I tell my volunteers when we did this last year, choose an activity that you're passionate about. If you're an environmental engineer, find an environmental activity. Um, Cause I think that when volunteering, if you're passionate about the subject matter, the activity will be more fun for the kids. So Deb, how do you pick, you're, you're doing a whole ton of activities. So have there been some, oh, actually, what have you had a dud activity one that you're like oh my gosh that was just horrible i'll never do that activity again and um, what what made it a dud i'm trying to think i mean the kids have always i mean all of the programs the kids have enjoyed um doing it i'm trying to think if there's anything that was a dud and i there was um Maybe it wasn't really a dud, it was a solar, my very first solar engineering project that I had with the students. You know, I mean, I was working on a shoestring budget, so I went to Five Below and bought the solar kit, which were actually really, really good kits, but I try to give them a, a variety of, you know, there were solar boats, there were solar robots, there were solar, you know, uh, other cars. So some of the solar, uh, solar windmills, some of the solar, projects from the uh, Five Below worked really, really well. And then there were some that, you know, the pieces didn't fit right. And in and, and terms of that, that was more or less a debt. But they saw the other projects, other solar things that worked and I was able to kind of replace them. So it really, you know, it wasn't really a debt, but I think, um, I think one thing that I would really stress is that whatever you do, do it first before you kind of <laughs> give it out to the kids. Like um, I think Katie alluded, uh, mentioned earlier. So it is very important to actually do it first and then you can work out the quirks. I mean, there was, um, I think you actually showed one of those pictures that um, where the students had the, it was a car that they were making. They had to solder the car and we bought it at a very low cost, which was nice, but it didn't come with any instructions. <laughs> So we had to sit like for, you know, the two nights to kind of separate all the pieces for each individual student and kind of mark every single piece for each, you know, every individual piece for each student. It worked out well in the end, but it was a dead in terms of preparation, but the kids really loved it. I mean, they enjoyed it a lot, but it took a lot of work to get it to that point. Yeah, so. and I think that's a good point because, you know, it's doing that activity first, A, you found out that, uh-oh, I don't have the instructions and I'm going to have to put all this together. But also when you do the activity, it's, it's really where you kind of uncover where the kids might stumble mm -hmm. or it gives you an opportunity to come up with a series of questions. Because right? remember, you're the facilitator, you're the volunteer, and you're not actually an in virtual, right? You can. This is what's so interesting about virtual learning or virtual facilitating. A lot of times we, we give in to our desire if the kids are having trouble, we might do it for them, but there's no way over virtual you can do it for them. But what kind of leading questions can you ask? You know, if you know where they might get stuck on their, um, um, on their pen factory or where they might get stuck on a critical load, if, you, if you've done the activity in advance, you can have some really great questions um, and maybe even some props that you can show them. Um, here's how I solved that problem, or here's what I did, um, or oh, it's not it's it's not standing up. What you know, what might you do? Yeah. Um, so I think it's even more critical because uh, you're not going to be able to save it by doing it for the kids, which we shouldn't be doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you were talking. Something did come to mind. It wasn't a question that was asked, but I wanted to get this information out there because it's really really important when you're doing virtual learning and you give the kids a kit. Just please remind them, don't lose anything. Because I've had a few students lose maybe a notebook so they couldn't record their results or lose a piece that was vital to the project or experiment that they were working on. And they just kind of basically had to sit there and watch. So it's important to remind them, put everything back. And there are small pieces, you know, sometimes that go into these kits that could easily fall out. So just kind of be cognizant of letting them know, make sure you don't lose this piece or make sure everything's back and you put it in a safe place. So that's really important. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> that's critical. Yeah. Um, all right. So just quickly, because um, I want to save some time to the end. Uh, you know, we have um, a whole series of activities and this one critical load. All the students need is some cards and uh, tape and a little piece of cardboard, you know, just 12 cards mm -hmm. um, where they're going to design a structure and then see how much weight it can hold on it. Um, and right here we have a video instruction. So if you're not comfortable giving the instructions, you can pick activities from Discover E where we have the video instructions, we have the, um, the um, actual um, instructions here uh, that you can download in Word. Um, all of our uh, instructions, uh, when we're thinking about kids working at home, we recommend that you, um, if you're gonna be emailing the kids in advance or giving the resources to the educator in advance, um, some kids have some bandwidth issues where they are in uh, spotty, um, um, they might have a spotty internet. So a Word document actually downloads a lot quicker than a PDF. Um, you don't need as much, um, as much uh, bandwidth for that. But in this at-home engineering, if you go to discovere.org and, and click on um, activities, you'll see at-home engineering. And um, there are uh, 10 different activities that have been uh, designed for students working at home, uh, very low cost materials, um, and easy to follow instructions. Uh, also, um, if you're uh, thinking, oh, I didn't get everything, I need more help. Um, if you go to the Engineers Week uh, page on Discover Engineering, um, we have a whole section on being a virtual role model. It goes more in depth on some of the stuff we've talked about here. Um, we also have uh, just ways you can celebrate engineers because we don't want to forget about that. Um, and where you can sign up to be a role model. So you can check that out. So um, before we wrap up, we just, and we have a few more minutes, but I want to get to questions. I want to know, how are you feeling out there? Um, in, um, oh, I want to uh, pull closed. It's not letting me. Hmm. Oh, here it goes. I can uh, launch my second poll. How are you feeling about what we've presented? Um, are you feeling good? Are you feeling okay? You're still a little bit nervous? Um, give folks uh, a, few, a few minutes uh, to answer that. Um, oh, look at that. Uh, we are uh, right now, we're neck and neck between feeling great and feeling okay. And um, I think we've calmed some nerves out there, Katie and Zanab. Um, so that's really good. I'm going to end the poll and share the results so folks can see that 45% are feeling great, ready and excited. 47 are okay. They still have some questions and some planning to do. And um, like I said, we've calmed a lot of nerves out there. So um, next up, uh, is what advice uh, do you have? What's your like one piece of go-to advice that you want to make sure people um, take away from today? I would say keep it simple. Um, you know, you don't have to do anything elaborate. You can still have an impact with a simple activity. That would be my go-to advice. Um. The other advice I would give, um, it's funny because I do this all the time, but every day when I present, I'm always nervous. So that's a natural feeling, you know, but just have a lot of patience. And when I mean patience, I mean patience with yourself and patience with the students. It takes a, a lot of patience really to teach. And that's, you know, something that you need to have for yourself and for the students. Yeah, and I would say have a backup person. Mm -hmm. um, because today when I went to launch the webinar, um, it wouldn't launch for me. So Ellen had to launch it. <laughs> I was like, I might be doing this webinar with no technology. So always have a little bit of backup because you never know uh, what's, what, could go, what, what could go sideways on you. Um, but uh, when we think about a formula for virtual success, and it's just what, uh, what Zanab and Katie said, you know, activities with easily sourced materials, just keep it simple engaging content and be your authentic self. 
um, you know, that passionate side of what you love about engineering and STEM is really going to come through and that's going to equal STEM positive students. Um, we also said we would give you some ready-made uh, opportunities. Uh, the Future City Competition is hosting its regional um, finals right now and we are looking for judges. Um, you can judge right from your desktop where you can read essays or look at city models or do live Q&A over, um, over Zoom with students. So go to futurecity.org and you can learn more about being a judge and you can register right there online. There's opportunities now through the middle of March. Um, so uh, there will be opportunities for your schedule. Um, uh, Try Engineering, they have a, um, a, a mentor uh, program there uh, online. That is a year long program. So you'd be, you'd be signing up for, for that uh, for a year. Uh, chats with change makers. If you are thinking, if you're in that 7%, you're really nervous, you're not sure what you want to do uh, every month. Uh, uh, Tiffany, a 10th uh, grader from Texas, interviews an engineer and we broadcast it live on Fridays and it's also available on our website um, and you can share that with students. Uh, Nesby has their summer seek camps and they are always looking for volunteers and they have those uh, virtually and in person. Um, great Minds in STEM, uh, SWE Next, uh, becoming a SWE Next mentor. Um, uh, they are doing a lot of that work virtually and uh, can set you up with some uh, girls. And then of course, uh, SciTech2U um, is looking for volunteers. And, and uh, Zanab, what's your, uh, uh, how would they go about uh, reaching out to you? Um, they could go to our website where our information is on there. You could call me um, directly, um, email me at zainab at scitech2u.org. Um, you could reach me by phone, via email. So that's. You can call her. She's on Facebook. She's on. Yeah, <laughs> she's yeah, on yeah. I'm Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Yeah. yeah. She's not hiding. Right. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, say you're like, okay, I just want to do something online, uh, uh, social, on social. We have a social media toolkit uh, this year. The, the, the background that you see behind me is a downloadable uh, Zoom background that you can use. Um, there's also uh, uh, how are you imagining tomorrow? Uh, you can uh, share uh, what, uh, what tomorrow looks like to you. And uh, that's right on the website. Um, you can go and grab that. Um, upcoming events uh, on February 10th, the Persist series kicks off with workplace norms that work. This is for women and men working in engineering, talking about how we can create more inclusive um, uh, engineering workplaces. Uh, February 23rd is creating inclusive STEM experiences, and you'll all be getting an invitation to that soon. February 25th um, is our next Chats with Changemakers, and Joan Higginbotham is an engineer and a former astronaut. Um, so uh, I see a lot of hand raising, and I see a lot of questions. Um, Ellen, what are um, some other questions from folks? Uh, we have some questions here about um, different types of events. For example, any tips um, for doing uh, larger scale events? Um, someone's planning something with, I think, you know, hoping to reach 250 girls at one event. So that's exciting. So what resources do we have for that? And then just as a piggyback to that, another question was about what about an event where, say, an engineer is um, speaking virtually through their their workplace, whether that's a, you know a construction site or an office or wherever they do their work, you know, is, has that any experience with that sort of event? Um, I know uh, I've heard from a lot of partners that they've been doing those more virtual field trips and um, having a lot of success uh, because they can get kids and get more kids in to um, to see their site and to see what actually goes on uh, in the. Uh, more exciting side, <laughs> the engineering. So I think that's great. Um, the person who's doing the 250 uh, kid event, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, I know that UT Austin um, 
is doing an event where they expect to have at least 5,000 students over 10 days. Um, and they're doing a series of booths um, that are staffed that will have different times where kids can do activities, see videos, and chat with uh, engineers. But um, Zanab and Katie, any advice do you have or, or uh, want to share? I've done virtual, uh, large virtual events before and breakout rooms work really well where you can um, have a smaller group interactions and then come back as a whole group. Um, for our outreach this year, we didn't want 100 kids on one call, so we broke it into separate days. So that'll be 20 kids per day for engineers week. Um, anything that you can do to get smaller group interaction within your event, I think is a positive. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I would agree. Um, smaller groups, I mean, you could do 100, but have maybe 10 volunteers and breakout rooms, you know, with 100 um, would be ideal. And if you're going to do something on a large scale, keep it really, really simple because you could have 100 different problems that, you know, one person can address at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's my suggestion. Have a lot of volunteers to support support you and it should go well yeah and katie with your hundred students you're breaking them up into five groups of 20 right with five different volunteers exactly yep so a group on monday a group on tuesday and so on mm -hmm. well that's nice ellen other questions um What's really great to see is in both the, the in the chat, uh, mainly we have some folks um, offering some advice to each other. So it's been a very active chat with a lot of great advice uh, flying around, which is terrific. Um, a couple of specifics. Um, one about, um, just curious to know, um, Zainab and, and, and Katie, what virtual platforms you use uh, for your events. And then another specific just with kits um, when you're, you know, any concern if you're mailing out kits about um, any sort of liability with that in the sense of, you know, do you need sort of a caution statement about, you know, the age it's meant for or, or that sort of thing. So again, it was just the virtual programs you use and then platforms rather and the, um, the question about kits and any caution statements with those. Um, PNC uses GoToMeeting as our platform. We use that, uh, we have GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar that we use in our everyday um, programs. We do webinars and, and our chapters have meetings. So we're gonna use that for this as well. Um, it allows everyone to have their camera on so that everyone can be seen and, and talk. Um, and then in terms of kits, our materials are just, paper, ruler, tape, you know, we didn't uh, include any sort of messaging, but I was in contact with every parent that signed up. Um, so they're well aware of what's coming home. Great, thank you. Dan? Yeah. And um, I've used, I've been using Zoom um, and I think Google Meets will work well too. I've used that for other tutoring, um, projects. So Zoom and Google Meets work. Um, in terms of, I always make everything age appropriate, even though I did aeronautics this year, you know, the high schoolers would probably make rockets, <laughs> whereas the elementary schoolers and middle schoolers would make straw rockets. And so, and everything was kind of, you know, age appropriate. So I didn't have any issues with that at all. Great. Um, and I will say, I have a, a couple other questions I'll, um, I'll share, but if, if we don't get to your questions, I've posted um, our email in, in the chat and uh, Thea may have it on her slide as well, but it's in the chat um, for, uh, to stay in touch. Uh, you can reach us at info at discovery.org or at social at discovery.org. Um, and we can have continue the conversation with all of you. Um, but one great question I have here uh, about um, just, you know, getting the word out um, to youth, especially for events that might be more open to folks. Um, any tips for, for spreading the word um, in particular with promoting, you know, equity and access um, to all and, and being sure to do that, you know, any best practices there? Mm. I would, um, one of the things that I use is newsletters, even your local um, churches, synagogues, or masjids, um, you could put it in their newsletter, word of mouth. Sometimes you'd be surprised how the type of reach you could get just through word of mouth, people who've experienced the program. So tell other people, you know, so 
You know, one really clever idea I heard um, was next door. If you're if you're on the next door platform in your local mm -hmm. community, um, you can put the word out that way too. I thought that was kind of fun. Katie. Uh, yeah, we use a lot of word of mouth through our, our members. Um, and then, like I said, we um, use education foundations. You could also try like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts to help spread the word. Anyone that has, um, you know, access to a large amount of, of the age group that you're trying to reach. It is one o'clock and I'm starting to see people drop off. Ellen, any last burning questions that, um, that we need to sneak in? Um, I don't think so, but I, I, again, really encourage people. I know some want to share what they're doing and, and may have very specific questions about resources, you know, how our resources can help. And, you know, we're happy to have that conversation with you offline. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will, when you leave, uh, a, a window will pop up with a link to a quick four question survey. Just tell us how we did. Um, uh, on uh, virtual outreach. This is the first time we've ever done a virtual outreach uh, webinar, so we're curious if this was helpful. Um, thank you, everyone, and, and, and a big thank you to Katie and uh, Zanab. You guys are, gals are amazing. Uh, I had lots of amazing things to share and do, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful Engineers Week. Uh, thank you all, and have a great rest of your day.